thank you to Antje uh, for inviting me uh, to speak. Uh, thank you to uh, Bernd Eno Elit uh, for uh, turning her on to my work uh, as well. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here today. It's a pleasure to get to have this discussion uh, with you all. Um, and I especially have to thank uh, Martin Archer um, because when I was invited to, to give this talk, um, I was thinking that it might be a nice opportunity um, to catch up with some of the research that I wasn't able to do because of the time limitations uh, while I was writing my book. I really wanted to look further into Juxta Voices and um, didn't have the chance before the book was published. Um, but uh, this is the first opportunity after the book is published for me to uh, engage in a little bit of research. I've never done this before. Um, I've presented often on my work and I've done lots of uh, interviewing. But I've never combined the two, uh, so this will be a bit of an experiment tonight, and I really am grateful that uh, Martin was open uh, to this idea and open to co-presenting with me. So we're going to start uh, by a 15-minute presentation about my work, about Martin's work, uh, then Martin and I will pose a few questions to each other, and then we'll open up the floor to questions uh, to all of you. And um, so I'm going to start uh, a little bit of a slideshow here to share uh, my work with you guys. Okay, so you're seeing that okay? Yeah. Okay, excellent, great. All right, so I do identify with that term sound singer. Uh, sound singer is a term that comes from uh, the poet uh, and singer Paul Dutton, uh, who you see there uh, up in the top uh, left-hand corner, a trio uh, picture from uh, me singing with uh, Phil Minton and Paul Dutton. Um, and so that means for me that I've done a little bit of contemporary classical singing um, in my life. I've done a little bit of sound poetry and I've done a lot of uh, free improvisation and free jazz. But important to the story of how I came to be involved with choral improvisation uh, is the fact that as well, I'm a music philosopher, historian, ethnomusicologist, and critical theorist. Uh, there's the cover of the book that Ben mentioned uh, that I published uh, about a year ago, Voices Found, Free Jazz and Singing. Um, and it was during my time researching the book that I learned about the good done by uh, groups like uh, Maggie Nichols Gatherings and her decades of group vocal improvisation organization, uh, improvising choirs like Phil Minton's Feral Choirs, uh, Paul Dutton's vocal workshops. Uh, very important to me in my history was uh, getting to work with Christine Duncan and her Element Choir uh, and getting to meet D.B. Boyko, who leads the Voice Over Mind Choir and the Express Your Voice Choirs. I got to see while doing the research for my book um, what a just how much time improvising vocalists have given to creating spaces for others to use their voice and how transformative those spaces have been for the participants in those kinds of groups. Um, it builds people's confidence. It forms community. Um, it, it can be a very, very transformative element in, in one's life. And an approach like Maggie Nichols uh, is to invite people to accept that all human vocal sound is of value. And so people that grew up thinking they have a bad voice or they shouldn't be singing uh, find spaces that all human vocal sound is celebrated in. Uh, and that allows them to use their voice, perhaps for some people, for the first time. Um, so I felt an ethical obligation uh, almost to continue the legacy of these artists' work because I had the great privilege of meeting uh, with them and learning about their histories. And so it's been about seven years now uh, that I've been leading choirs myself. So I became a choral uh, improvisation organizer, a community music advocate uh, because of uh, these encounters that I had. And I started by forming the Guelph uh, Vocal Exploration Choir and Gatherings. Um, and I really screwed up when I did that. I made it about a, a, a five week long program where I brought Phil Minton and Maggie Nichols to Canada and they worked with a, a group of singers, non-professional singers and professional singers, mixed ability uh, environment. Um, and, uh, and then we invited Christine Duncan and Paul Dutton um, to come as well. And uh, we did a big, concert at the end. Um, and then I left Guelph and I didn't really give um, the group the tools to sustain themselves without me. 
So when I moved to St. John's, Newfoundland, I started my second vocal exploration choir and I made sure not to do that. Uh, I made sure to work into the sessions that we had regularly, um, training uh, so that uh, others uh, could lead the group in my absence. And when I left, I appointed two co-artistic directors and five years later, the group is still um, very productive, uh, meeting regularly um, and, uh, and thriving without me. Um, so that became a very important part of my practice to give uh, groups the tools to, to exist without me. Uh, and I've started my third choir here. Um, I got a job at the University of Groningen uh, about five years ago. And uh, about six months after arriving, I formed the Groningen Vocal Exploration Choir. And we've been on all kinds of adventures together uh, in that time. Uh, and then thanks to the pandemic, uh, all of a sudden we couldn't meet. And so we started um, meeting online. And I realized that well, this is a beautiful opportunity to invite in uh, all the members of all the various choirs that I've led in these three cities, and then to welcome as well um, anyone from anywhere uh, that wanted to participate in our online sessions. And so uh, those happened twice a month, and then the Transna Transnational Vocal Exploration Choir was formed because of that. So my methodology in leading these groups are to engage in free improvisation. So we do entirely free pieces together. Um, we also use structured improvisation, which if you don't know are compositions that consist of simple rules for improvisation. And we also use conducted improvisation. So I use a, a series of hand signals uh, in order to uh, conduct improvisation. Uh, and you'll see that in uh, a little clip uh, that uh, I'll play at the end of uh, my section of this talk. So I wanted to present my philosophy, my approach and my goals. So since I, I come from a research background and a critical theory background, um, my intention is to try to foster practices that have social justice implications, um, that, um, that maybe question uh, existing practices and norms uh, in ways uh, to make them uh, more impactful perhaps. Um, and I've been devoted in my time to what I call radical inclusivity, um, which means to me that the choirs I lead are open to anyone and everyone. Uh, there's, there's no limitation to who can participate. Uh, and I, I try whenever possible um, to, to organize these spaces with no cost uh, to participate. So the sessions that I lead uh, regularly twice a month, uh, you, you don't ever pay for those and, and almost nothing that I do uh, anyone pays for. Um, so voices from any musical or non-musical background can join. And that's been really important for me because it often means that uh, it, we're creating an intercultural, intergenerational space of exchange and different singing traditions um, can meet uh, together uh, in the spaces that we create. Um, in these groups, uh, they're open as well to all vocal and non-vocal oral sounds. So we're inclusive in terms of who gets to participate, but we're also inclusive in terms of what sounds uh, can be used uh, in these spaces. Uh, another uh, detail under radical inclusivity is whenever possible, uh, conducting duties are shared with any member of the choir that's interested in conducting. Um, so, uh, like I said earlier, uh, when I ran my first choir, I was the only one really that conducted other than the guest conductors that I brought in. Um, but I, I changed that practice and, and made sure I made time in our uh, twice monthly sessions uh, to teach others uh, to conduct uh, using the hand signals that I mentioned earlier. And finally, I try to establish choirs in different locations uh, that can operate without me. So this is one of my goals for the future, to keep doing this, um, to go places, to have a genuine um, exchange uh, with, with various communities and help them build uh, these kinds of groups in various uh, locations. So my philosophy as well has to do with being participant-centered. Um, so that means for me, the only structured improvisations that we really focus on are ones where the composition does not overshadow the presence of the participants uh, that are there and their ideas. So I don't want audiences really to focus on the composition as much as to focus on the human bodies in the space and the choices they're making. Nearly all of the content of the pieces or performances um, that I lead emerge from the spontaneous contributions of the participants present. And though during conducted pieces, the conductor has a compositional function, there is a kind of power dynamic, the content emerges from the choices of participants and the pieces develop from those choices. And 
Participants are free at any time to deviate from the conductor and add any sound at any time if they feel compelled. So if they want, they can ignore the conductor. And the fact that the pieces emerge out of the spontaneous ideas of the choir, I think, is very meaningful for a lot of members because suddenly you can see an idea that came out of you spontaneously and suddenly blossom into the generating uh, elements of a broader uh, real-time composition that emerges in these contexts. And finally, I hold space and offer gatherings twice a month, but participants are always free to come or not come. If no one else comes to a, even a performance that we're giving, um, that becomes a solo concert for me then. Um, so there, I try not to have any particular expectation about what the group will be at any given moment. Uh, it hasn't happened yet that uh, a choir concert has become a solo performance. Um, hopefully it doesn't, uh, but, it, but I'll be ready if it does. So finally, uh, the last point, I, I think I, I dedicate myself to uh, a notion of radical acceptance or, and this is Maggie Nichols' term that's become very important to me, uh, social virtuosity. So what this means to me is not allowing notions of musical value or our sense of an audience's musical expectations when we perform publicly to overshadow the human value of the participants, their choices, and the emergence that results from their sounding together. So my philosophy is that there's no bad voices, there are no unmusical improvisations, and there are no sound events that are lacking in value or richness. There are only failures to hear, to witness or sense the human value of certain kinds of soundings. So though I do want the result to be enjoyed by audiences, that's a secondary concern to fostering inclusivity, diversity, and a participant-centered experience for me. And then finally, since I don't know who will attend the gatherings or the performances, this, this teaches me to accept change without expectation, which is a profound practice, I think, um, that this helps me foster, that, that applies to my day-to-day -day life, including like getting through a pandemic. So, um, despite the fact that the musical for me is secondary, uh, magical and musical things always happen, and I wanted to share with you a few quick examples uh, before I finished of some of those magical uh, moments. So I'll play you a, a short clip um, of the St. John's Vocal Exploration Choir, so the second uh, choir that I formed, um, and uh, this particular clip is from 2015. Oh, and maybe... Uh, can, did you all hear that breath sound just now? Is this audible? Uh, no sound. There's no sound. Okay, I'm going to have to restart the slideshow. Sorry. I'm new on Jitsi. Uh, so just give me one second. Um, there's a little button I have to click and that I forgot to click. Uh, so now you're not seeing my screen, I don't think. Uh, and now I'm clicking that little button and giving you back my screen. Okay, so three short, about one minute long clips, and then I'll be done. So I said earlier that uh, this choir is for everybody, uh, anybody that wants to use their voice. Uh, I, I met the very young, very old, um, and uh, we are lucky to tonight have with us uh, a special guest conductor. Uh, we'll see. You want to conduct us? <laughs> this is called Short Sound Piece. <laughs> So um, if you're interested, you can watch the whole piece on YouTube. There's some really interesting uh, musical moments uh, after that. And I don't know if you caught that, but uh, Wolfie, um, because one of the choir members was saying the word peanut, uh, said if you need to use the bathroom, uh, it's right over there. Um, so the next clip is from uh, 2018, and this is the Groningen Vocal Exploration Choir. Uh, this is an excerpt from about a 35 minute long uh, improvisation that we did um, that was built around a theme that we were asked to meditate on, uh, which was the theme of responsible uh, gastronomy. Yeah. Yeah. 
yang 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 den Wirsing vierteln und die Viertel in dünne Streifen schneiden. Den Spinat verlesen, mehrmals gründlich in handwarmem Wasser waschen und abtropfen lassen. Den Sellerie unter fließendem Wasser bürsten, 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 wenn nötig schälen und in kleine Würfel schneiden. Schneiden! All right, and I'll play you uh, a little clip of our online uh, adventures. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
And so again, I just remind you that. Uh, oh. So I said earlier that. Uh, There's <laughs> <laughs> a way to trigger them all at once. Um, I'll just remind you that uh, those those online adventures, especially, um, we welcome uh, all of you. Um, wow. I really don't know how to use Jitsi. Uh, we welcome all of you uh, to to join with us, and you can find us on Facebook uh, under Groningen Vocal Exploration Choir, or you can send me an email um, to join those. And so that's my section, and now we'll move uh, to Martin and Juxta Voices. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, that was uh, it, it, it. Was interesting to um, watch those clips and draw some similarities and. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, differences between Chris's projects and just Juxta Voices. Um, we started Juxta Voices about 10 years ago, um, and there was never a particular intention that it would be a long-term project. I actually um, wanted to form a group of voices with a very specific project in mind. At, at the time, I was making... Um, the first album by uh, my improvising rock group, the Orchestra of the Upper Atmosphere. Uh, and part of my idea for that album was that I wanted a large group of voices to act as a chorus. And um, the, the, the place I was coming from was very much the vocal um, music of, of Stockhausen and, uh, and, and the Getty. I was, I was interested in the idea of what would happen if you marshaled a large number of uh, voices to produce the, the, the sounds and textures that you could get at using a large number of people. Um, like Chris's projects, there was no intention that there was a, that there was a, a singing bar that you had to be able to jump over to be in the group. So I simply went through my address book to start that off and asked a lot of people who I thought might be interested in coming along one Saturday to try and work some material out. Um, a lot of my personal circle are, are people who are already working poetry or improvised music or the, or, or, or the visual arts. So it wasn't a great deal of work for me to find uh, 20 or so people who would be interested in having a go at this. And uh, we, we, we got together and we started to uh, uh, work on some simple workshop ideas and also to develop this uh, the music for the recording. However, it was immediately apparent to everyone who was there on that first session that we've got this amazing potential resource here, which uh, ought to have its own uh, life beyond the recording project. Um, everyone was very enthusiastic about, about um, uh, uh, make, making it work. Um, but I think the, the big difference between what Juxta Voices does and what um, Chris's uh, workshop groups are, are, are doing is that, that from day one, uh, we all decided um, uh, that, that it would be a performance orientated uh, group um, because of my other music that I'm involved in um, it, it just came to be naturally that Juxta Voices would be a group where the um, the performance would be the main thing that the group was about ra rather than the experience of the participants so whilst a lot of our methodologies um, and um, the way we go about things and the way we create uh, material is probably pretty similar to what Chris does, uh, our intention from day one was to be able to stand on stage and produce a uh, 45 or a 60 or a 75 minute coherent performance that uh, an audience uh, at an arts event would uh, find enjoyable, varied, and uh, stimulating. So um, 
I guess that's pretty much the main difference uh, in, uh, in the intention. Um, also, I really liked the idea of a large number of voices. I think it's very different to be working with five, six or uh, eight or nine performers, as we saw Chris um, working with there, uh, versus having a room of 25, um, 30 singers. And, and um, every Jackson Voices performance we've done over the last 10 years, uh, I think we've never been less than maybe 22 um, singers in the choir and that that in itself presents some um, challenges as to how you create material for so many people. Um, I've just put a, a, a few clips together which kind of illustrate um, some of the ways we go about creating our material uh, and the, 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 the first clip I'm, I'm going to play you is pretty much the the closest the group ever comes to uh, free improvisation. And uh, as you can see, this is a graphic score. It was uh, devised by uh, Derek Beely, who's a, uh, a, a visual artist and a poet. And the function of this score is simply to give the singers some material to work with so that they don't have to create it on the spot. Other than that, the piece is completely improvised but because the singers have already got this material in front of them, it enables them to concentrate on generating material on the spot. It enables them to concentrate on listening to what the other singers are doing, um, reacting to that and creating little structures within, uh, within the music as it's performed. Um, so I'm going to ask Chris to play uh, clip one and you can hear a, li a, a little extract from Helvetica um, which was uh, devised by uh, Alan Holsey based on um, this visual score by Derek Beely. So yeah, that was um, Helvetica, which uh, finally appeared on our album, our third album, in fact, which is called Warning May Contain Notes. Um, and it, I think something I've definitely learned over the 10 year period is that there's, there's a big difference between asking a vocalist to improvise and asking uh, an instrumentalist uh, to, uh, uh, to, to improvise. Um, especially for a vocalist who, you know, doesn't happen to be Maggie Nichols or Yap Blanc or Julie Tippett or Dano Suzuki. Um, you know, people who don't necessarily spend their, uh, a substantial portion of their lives thinking about how they're going to use their voice in an extended circumstance. It's very useful for them to have some raw material like this just to get the uh, uh, the ball rolling. And that, that's essentially what you've just heard in the uh, in the piece we've just played. Um, my co-director of the group, Alan Holsey, is, is, a, is, a, is a poet. And again, an, another thing that was very natural for us to do from 
day one was actually con um, concentrate on using texts as the basis of our performance. And again, we, we found that using a text gives a given performance piece uh, a consistent mood and character, whilst, same as in, in Chris's projects, leaving the vast majority of the detail up to uh, the improvisational skills of the performers. So I'm going to play you another way we do that to using um, a, a fixed text. This is a this is a piece by Alan Holsey with an extremely long title that you can see up at the top, which is "Whatever Last Art Let Terminal Alien Endless Song," um, and the technique we use to create this point is to actually break words in a in a set sequence, but break them down into their sounds. And then we begin to combine those sounds into words, and then we begin to combine those words into phrases. Which means that whenever we perform that piece, you could tell it was that piece, because you, you heard the sounds and the words and the structure. But of course, it was completely different every time we did it. Um, so here's a short um, extract from the piece whose name I won't attempt to uh, say again. Can play clip two for us, please, Chris. So that was um, Whatever Last from uh, 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 the first album we made, which was entitled uh, Juxt Another Antiquire from Sheffield, which any Zappa fans out there might find vaguely amusing. Um, with the next clip, I'm going to go to the completely the other end of the spectrum. This is a straight setting which I made of a text by Samuel Beckett. Um, and, um, here we use um, improvised ornamentation to the basic text. One reader performs the text as written. The other choir members are asked to just perform one word in each line um, using whatever note or sound or, or speech they want to use. So this is um, three iterations of a poem by Samuel Beckett. What would I do without this world faceless, incurious, where to be lasts but an instant, where every instant spills in the void the ignorance of having been without this way, where in the end body and shadow uh, together are engulfed. What would I do without this silence, where the murmurs die, the paintings of frenzies towards succor, towards love? without this sky that soars above its ballast dust. What would so, I do 
Day before. They're completely different to the, to the pieces that we've uh, uh, that, that we've already heard. But a nice short performance piece, which um, certainly builds some variety into uh, uh, any gig that we do. And that 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 is important to us. We don't want to stand on stage for sixty minutes, seventy five minutes, and do something, make a performance which is so undifferentiated that. Um, um, it becomes less enjoyable for the audience. So that, that variety is important to us. Um, the next clip I'm going to play is one of our um, spatial pieces and just basic John Cage here. We've got a grid of words uh, which the singers can choose from. Um, typically, when performing this piece, it will be uh, geared to the performance space. So we'd, we'd likely be distributed um, uh, throughout uh, the room or the building even and singers are simply uh, asked to speak or sing any word at any time but leaving substantial silences to make sure that we create a, a soundscape which fills the whole space that we're performing in. So this is a piece uh, again with text by Alan Holsey, music by uh, uh, myself and this is drawn from Know Well. operates and uh, um, that recorded version is a pretty full-on version that um, in, in other circumstances we, we would have performed that in a much more spacious um, mm. and, 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 and calmer way. Um, I'm going to play you something now where we go for maximum complexity. This is a piece where the group is divided into three groups with three conductors. Um, each um, each group is is very tightly conducted to perform one word at a time. Um, individual soloists are conducted to perform one word at a time. But the wild card in the piece is that any choir member at any point can step to the front of the stage and perform one of those solo lines up at the uh, up at the uh, top of the page in whatever style they wish. And once again, this is a piece uh, with text by Alan Halsey uh, and music by myself, and this is called An Impunity of Diane's. <laughs> Creatures generally want and press them, come at this. Oh! 
Readjust, General Watson. So, yeah, short extract there from uh, an impunity of dyads. Uh, the clip I'm going to finish with um, kind of proves that when all else fails, you can simply bludgeon people uh, by singing uh, um, as loud and as long as possible. And here is a, a very dense piece of music, which is from the end section of a piece called Hanu, which is composed by myself. And this is juxtavoices. Um, uh, proving that uh, if you're going to sing a 32 note chord then probably any 32 notes will be uh, will be just fine so uh, a short section here from Hanu So well, there we have um, six uh, Jackson Voices clips, and sorry, those, those have gone on a, a little longer than I uh, uh, intended, but ho hopefully what that gives you uh, some kind of impression of is, is that the varied methodologies we use to try and make an interesting performance group. So that's pretty much all I've got to uh, 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 say in my section, uh, if you'd like to move the thing along, Chris. Yeah, um, I have so many questions for you, but we have limited time. And so my questions, the most important ones, fall into two basic categories. Um, the impact uh, that this group has on participants uh, and the impact that this group has on audiences. Um, but I guess I'll start by asking you, um, since uh, the initial impulse to put a group together came out of another recording project that you had, um, you wanted a, a large number of voices. Was it just a practical choice to sort of mix trained and untrained uh, voices in that case then? Why didn't um, you only incorporate uh, trained singers for that project? Okay, well, no, uh, I, I certainly don't have the composing skills to write a choral piece for 35 voices. I, 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 I'm, I'm not particularly interested in doing it and I certainly don't have the skill to do it. You know, uh, if I wanted to be James Macmillan, I would have started doing things differently um, 40 years ago. Um, so, no, it was a case of, of working with the people that I, that, that, that I knew uh, and because I'm an improvising musician, I knew that I would be able to coax um, a large group of people towards the result that I wanted without me having to sit down at a desk and a lot of manuscript paper um, and, and, and then needing people who could read what I'd written. I, d I didn't want any of that. I, I basically wanted um, uh, Stockhausen and Legate but without actually uh, doing any of the work to get there. But you live in the UK, so you have access, of course, to um, a great number of experienced uh, improvising professional singers. Um, why did you use um, non-musical professionals? Well, um, yeah, yes, there are, there are a good few great singers uh, in the UK, and I'm, I'm very lucky to work with, uh, in particular, Julie Tippett to, to, to make music. But this wasn't that. Um, it had to be a group that could meet regularly in Sheffield, which is in the middle of the uh, country, and 
I, I, I did want it to be a large group. If, if my initial idea had been to have a small group, then I would probably have approached um, um, in, in individuals. But this, 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 this was always going to be an amateur group, but it was always going to be a large group. So uh, just, just as a pragmatic um, decision, it came from people in the immediate area who I already knew. Okay. Um, I love that story of the fact that once you got them together uh, for this project uh, and started working with them, uh, there was an energy in the air. Uh, there was, it was apparent to everyone, you said, uh, that this had potential. And then you honored that, um, that energy, uh, that sense of potential by continuing the group and developing it into a, a regular group. Um, can you tell us a bit about the, the different stages of the group and then what it's meant uh, to the individuals that are participating? Could you tell us a, a bit about some of the people who are in the group and whether um, this might be their, the only place that they use their voice or um, some of well, the benefits they've uh, shared with you about being part of the group? That's, that, that's certainly the case. I mean, there's a, there's a whole range of experiences within the group. So some of the people who are engaged in improvised music all, all the time, and, and in fact, you, you heard some instrumental work in, in one of those clips that I just played. Other people would only ever think about um, um, improvisational vocal music once a month when we rehearsed. It would play no other part in their life. Uh, they, uh, quite a few people haven't done anything like it before. Um, in particular, people who joined the group after uh, at the end of a gig, people would come up and say, well, "What the heck were you doing? Um, you know, could I have a look at, at the? You know, everyone's standing there with a folder, um, obviously reading instructions from it, and uh, we get a lot of questions about what were you doing, how did you do it? So and then often it would end up with, "Well, can I come along and do that as well? I'd really like to do that." So of course the answer was yes come on in, we'd love you to come along and, uh, uh, and join us. So um, in terms of the constituency of the group, I'd, I'd probably say that uh, um, over the 10 years, there are probably about a dozen people who've been in it from day one and other people came and, 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 and went. Uh, there, there was one period where we were so busy with gigs, it was actually quite high pressure just to get rid of just to rehearse and get ready for gigs. And that was too much for some people. Uh, other people wanted more singing, other people wanted less singing and more pure improvisation. And, and uh, so, so uh, um, but people came and went, but I guess for the last four or five years, it's been a pretty stable group, but it's still a mix of people who are experienced performers and inexperienced performers. Uh, and right across the 10-year period, we've stuck to our initial premise was that no, no piece that we ever write um, involves having to sing a fixed pitch. That, that there are no notated pictures ever with Injection Voices music. And amazingly, we've managed to uh, stick to that over the years. The the story about the audiences um, and how they they during the performance are thinking about well how is this happening they're trying to figure that out and and uh, they come up and ask you about that afterwards uh, and then but also want to be included want to see if there's a possibility for them to get excited I was thinking about that today and I'll, some of the vocalists who run these kinds of groups uh, like Tomomi Adachi and his Royal Chorus um, use the uh, the term punk choir. And I always kind of wondered about that. Why, why punk? Uh, why use that term? Um, but I, I, I understood it today when I was thinking about um, that, um, that, that sense of, of feeling included uh, from the audience is, is something that's important. What punk means to me is a music that when you listen to it, you feel like you can start a band yourself. Um, and so that, that, that sense that audience members want to become a part of it, um, I think is important. Um, do, do you do this work in order to uh, have a transformative effect on audiences? Um, how do you react when they ask to be part of the group? These are questions. I well, well we're, we're, we're delighted when that happens because that, that's uh, that, that's the core of it. But uh, I think the, the punk point is a good one. Um, uh, we, we said from day one of the choir, look, all, all you need to learn at these workshops and rehearsals is to have the confidence to 
uh, know that when you step out on stage in front of an audience of 50 people or or whatever that it, it, you know you are you are doing something that they are going to enjoy and we're going to work really hard at making pieces that people will enjoy but in order for that to come about you don't have to be a great singer all you need to do is contribute your bit we're going to sit and work these pieces out together in workshop we're going to go over them and over them until everyone's really happy and relaxed about what they're doing and then we're going to go on stage and it's going to be great and you've got to believe me when i tell you it's going to be great um, so I, I, I think that's the kind of empowerment that um, uh, Juxtavoices members have, uh, have hopefully had uh, o o over the years. It's, it's kind of bypassed skills that they don't need to have, uh, but it's engendered uh, their sense of trust in, in what Alan and I are doing, that, you know, we're not going to let them down by leading them into a situation which has got... Which has got uh, an outcome that neither they enjoy nor the audience enjoys. Uh, yeah, but um, I think at the same time, you're definitely providing uh, the audience with sounds that will code as certain listeners as untrained voices. Uh, I was reading through some of the YouTube comments today, and certainly some listeners hear this music and they mark it as n a not musical or non-music to some extent because of the sounds perhaps of some of the voices how do you how do you think about that and have you had to defend the project uh against dismissal no it is what it is you know if you don't like it then you don't have to listen to it <laughs> fair enough yeah it, um, it, it's not my job to make people like things but, yeah, but yeah. it is it is my job as organizer of the choir to make sure we present uh, an audience experience so that people will that people will, will be engaged by and you, you know um uh, here, here's a great story we 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 used to do an occasional uh gig in the in the in the very resonant space of the stairwell of our uh, our, our, our local library, and, and we, we, we did uh, uh, we, we did a piece there, and um, and uh, at the end of it, we, we, heard, we heard this uh, lady down at the bottom shouting out, "It's a bag of tripe! It's a bag of tripe!" And she she walked out. But then ten minutes later, she came back <laughs> to listen to more of it. That's an that's an apocryphal uh, Jackson Voices uh, tale. But you know, we're, we 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 don't. It doesn't bother us if people don't like it. It would be very unreasonable of us to expect everyone to like it. But we, we hope we'll engage them and we hope we won't be boring. Do you intentionally want to use sounds that might challenge them? Well, I, I think we don't have any choice. When, you, when, you, when, you've, got, when you've got 30 untrained singers... I mean, we do ex we do ex we do exploit that. We do a, we do a, a piece called Ascent, where I require the voices to start at the very bottom of the range and sit right at the top of the range and then keep going higher and higher. And the voices just disintegrate. And people absolutely shred their voices uh, uh, to it. Uh, um, and yeah, it's not a pleasant experience. It's the, it's the sound of the fabric of the music coming apart. So yeah, um, uh, we, we certainly don't attempt to sound nice. Okay, and then my last question has to do with the library stairwell. Um, you've done some amazing site-specific projects. Uh, I'd really like to hear a little bit about the um, the River Dawn Engine project, uh, the Bear Pit project, and the Riot Act project. Okay, right. Um, I, I'll also tell you about uh, our, our, our best one as well. Uh, our, our most wonderful uh, site-specific piece is, is uh, uh, was composed by... Uh, uh, text by Geraldine Monk, who, who, you, can, who you can see amongst our, our number here. I, I conceived the, 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 the music. It, it, uh, uh, Alan Halsey uh, participated in the, in the composition as well. Um, it's, a, it's an Elizabethan house in Sheffield, and I was visiting it one, so I noticed that, that I was upstairs in the house, there were gaps in the floorboards. And I thought, wouldn't it be, it'd be great if we made a piece where we sing through gaps in the floorboards and the audience is in the room below? So that, that's, the, that's the kind of site-specific thing where we might do. And actually, at the climax of the piece, we lowered the score down through the gaps in the floorboards. Choir members walked into the downstairs room 
tore a bit off the score and started performing it one after another. So that that's us, and then we dropped fresh herbs through the, uh, through the through the gaps as well. So that that's an amazing conception by Geraldine Monk, uh, uh, who's who's one of our members. The River Don engine, we're we're happy in Sheffield to host. Um, at the Kellam Island Industrial Museum. Uh, they have a steam engine that's the size of a house. Why wouldn't you want to, re to uh, uh, write a, po uh, a piece which uh, accompanied the engine for the, for the 90 seconds uh, uh, that, that, that they have it running? So um, uh, we, 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 we did that also. I, I think a site-specific thing gives us the inspiration to create something new rather than just do something we've already done. It's a, it, it's a challenge to say, well, we've got to be in the space. These are the sounds that are there. There's the, here's the atmosphere that's there. What can we, what can we do with it? Wonderful. Um, so I, I won't be so arrogant as to, to think that you have questions for me, um, but I'll give you the opportunity in case <laughs> you do. Um, and if not, we'll open the, the floor open to audience questions for either of us. I guess the, uh, the question I was going to ask was whether you particularly share my belief, I suspect you don't, that there is actually a fundamental difference between an improvising singer and an improvising instrumentalist. I actually see them as two completely different things, but um, uh, that, that might be a, a minority view within, within this uh, group. I think I can both understand it and disagree with it. Um, I, I have worked with a lot of individuals who are improvising for the first time um, and they often find it very scary and need something to sort of hang on to. And I think the conduction system, uh, the hand signals that I use, is that for a lot of people, if they're told sort of a parameter of what to be doing, then they feel very comfortable. Um, so in that case, I, I do agree that that sometimes uh, singers uh, need something to hang on to. But but fundamentally, I think once they're, they're confident and experienced, I would disagree with that statement. I think the singer has as many resources, infinite resources, as the, as the instrumentalist. I think that maybe comes with time uh, and what one, one pragmatic yeah. thing for juxtavoice is there's always been lack of time. We yeah. rehearse yeah. for three hours once a month. Um, people aren't going to build up an extended language. Uh, well, maybe 10 years later, but uh, uh, they're not going to do it particularly quickly. Okay, then I guess we'll open up um, the floor to, to the audience. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in hearing from uh, members of Juxta Voices about their experiences, what they've uh, got out of being part of the group, um, what benefits it's brought to their life. If anyone wants to speak to that, that would be really exciting. Or if anyone has a question for either Martin or myself, they can pose that, open their mic and pose the question. Is my mic on? You it is, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think one of the surprises to me about Juxta Voices is that um, he, he, he arrives there from the start and, and Geraldine was and various other people um, who, are, who are interested in the, in the project from a sound poetry and music point of view. And it was only quite later, about three years later, when we, we were into it, how much we heard from people who, as Martin said, often had no other experience, whatever, of performing or, or using their voices at all. But how they were telling us that it had changed their lives in some way. It had given them, I remember one guy who, who wrote saying that he'd given him all new confidence in his, his work in some kind of management job. I mean, this was certainly very far from what, what we were expecting. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to connect that in a way with, with what you were asking, Martin, about um, audience and our own performance. I mean, to me, I, I don't really care about the audience very much. I think it's so long as we are... Do, I, I, mean, I enjoy a rehearsal or a workshop just as much as I enjoy a performance. In fact, I, I enjoy them more because you've got much more to and fro with the members. You've got much more input from the members. So any one of our pieces starts off as something which um, Geraldine or Martin or I have written. Um, but by the time we ever get it to a performance state, then it's completely changed by the fact that 
what people can do, what it brings out in them, what they bring to it, and, and, and so on. But it's within that that I, I find it most interesting. Um, and I think that if that's going on within the group, and I'm sure you find this, Chris, that if that's going on within the group, then it's going to get to the audience somewhere. I mean, some of them are mm. going to, some of them are going to swear at us, or <laughs> others are going to come up and say, "Yeah, we want to join." And and many of our present members did join that way, I, I, I think, and some of them have, have stayed and have been, you know, major contributors to to the to the group. And also, we've seen people who have come. You know, a long time ago with very little confidence and would just you know, hum along in the background or something who, who by now will do settlers for us uh, with quite strong voices which they never knew they had um <laughs> so all that comes along and i think if that's working within the group it's going to work in performance for whoever's interested and like martin you know, I, I i'm not interested in telling people well you know, you've got to like this because we like it. Um, it's of no interest to me, whatever. Well, thank you for adding that. And thank you for being here today. It's it's wonderful to yeah. hear your perspective can on I this. Just, thank uh, you for putting this on. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, w I was wondering, uh, Chris, if you, uh, your method of working, and you said that uh, during a thing, if somebody wants to just uh, go almost like feral and airwall within your group mm -hmm. nobody's going to uh come back at them and say you can't do that in actual fact although when we have a performance that we're going to get ready for performance we have the most vicious rows <laughs> amongst ourselves if somebody says well i want to do that and they we do have a, a kind of form going on that there is an agreement at the end that something doesn't work or we don't like something or we don't like somebody's interjection or you'll get certain people in a quiet bit that are being very, very loud and you'll say, well, just can you not shut up a bit? Mm -hmm. Now, would you actually say that? I mean, would, would, how, how prescriptive are you are you more so than us we, we can be quite sort of like we all agree in the end or agree to disagree but i wondered if you just let anything go anything that's not harming um anyone physically <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I've i've committed myself um to that philosophy and it comes from working with maggie nichols um maggie talks about this kind of scenario in the gatherings um where someone will come uh with an electric guitar or some some instrument that can drown out the rest of the instruments and they'll you know they'll turn it up to 11 and they'll proceed to drown everyone out and and i think the impulse of a lot of musicians maybe most musicians would be to immediately you know, unplug that person and, and shut them down and stop them. Um, but Maggie says, no, the, uh, when you're when you're having that feeling like someone else needs to quiet down and leave space for others, maybe you're not fully understanding. They need to be doing that right now. There might be something inside them um, that needs to take up that space. And you can find it within yourself. You can find the generosity within yourself to give them that space. And then what's going to happen is eventually they will come down on their own. Um, so I'm, I'm committed to the improvisation as a practice in which these kinds of social dynamics can unfold. And I think sometimes having a particular expectation um, can make sure that those, those processes aren't happening. And sometimes a composition can be that expectation, right? Having a, a particular artistic aesthetic that you want to achieve can sometimes get in the way of that process. Of course, that's a, a noble goal for all, all kinds of other reasons. We need that. Uh, but in the spaces that I create, I am dedicated to uh, making sure that these kinds of processes uh, can unfold without a sense of what needs to be happening, um, silencing or not leaving people the space they need uh, to improvise with. So, you, but you must, there must be at times when you think, oh, I really don't like that, but you will just Absolutely. let that go. <laughs> yeah, but, that, but that's, that's something I have to fix in myself, I think. Yeah. So I, I tried to reflect that in my comments earlier. Um, that, that I think it's, it's my lack of generosity in that moment uh, when I'm deeming something else to be aesthetically wrong or not the, um, the, not the musical idea I want to present. And that's very hard as someone that has, I have been part of professional music worlds um, over the last 20 years. 
Um, and and I, I recognize that that uh, sometimes um, you know the, if the aesthetic result is not something that audiences will expect, um, there will be consequences that happen to me because of that. Um, but I I am dedicated to creating those kinds of spaces and perhaps challenging uh, audiences um, to have that kind of process going on inside themselves as well to to let. Uh, the human value of whatever's happening be to sort of find that generosity within themselves. Um, so it's it's a, a sort of critical and philosophical approach that I've devoted myself to. But do you never get to a point where you, you say, this isn't working, stop, stop. I mean, that we get to that a lot, but even if we're working for a little low Yeah, right? we, we, we really, yeah. We, we feel very free. Um, if, if I could use your word, very generous with each other, being able to tell each other if we don't think something is working. Do you know what I mean? It, de it depends what you want, I think, because uh, we are we don't uh, make pieces for the audience specific, so it can be what it is at that moment. And although sometimes I even still think it's difficult, <coughs> or not easy to accept some of the 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 other members in in some situations but then when i go home i think oh, okay okay uh, but it's it's a, well it's a kind of training to become more generous to others and to accept everything and just listen and yeah that's, enjoy. that's, a, very good, that's a very good illustration of of the slightly different approach well yeah, yeah. mentally different approaches we're having we we are a performance group yeah, yeah. We, we've got pragmatic issues. We've got limited time to, to prepare pieces for performance, so, and that, that that curtails some unlimited freedoms within the, within the group. Just just well, just a, a, a pragmatic measure. Yeah, it's interesting to have to have these two different groups uh, showcased at the same time, or these two different methods showcased at the same time, and and see how many uh, similarities there still are. I mean, I think there's yeah. you're still you're yeah. still building something really beautiful for the community. Um, mm -hmm. There is still this uh, this radical inclusivity going on in your group. You're still producing a lot of the same sounds that I think have. Uh, social and political effects. Chapter five of my book is all about how um, certain kinds of um, extra normal vocal sounds, I think, have certain kinds of uh, effects on audiences that disrupt their their symbolic order or their sense of what voices should sound like or what human voices should sound like. Um, so it, it's wonderful to highlight these points of connection uh, at the same time as realizing um, there's different goals uh, and different kinds of working methods, uh, both of which are, are incredibly valuable, of course. Um, so we, we're running out of time, but uh, we might have time for a couple more questions from the audience or uh, and a couple more comments from anyone else that wants to make them. Anyone else burning with uh, something they want to ask? I'm burning. All right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just want to uh, say something about the last topic. Um, well, I have to say that... Uh, this freedom inside the choir with Chris, uh, the vocal exploration choir, is just enormous, uh, beautiful, because uh, sounds uh, that are unknown or maybe sounds I might not like, they are open for me to become a new uh, experience. So even I don't like them, maybe I will like them. Uh, maybe not at that moment, but maybe later. That's uh, right. and, and maybe I will never like them, but maybe I will like them in, in about 20 years. So it, it's like a training uh, section for many people to, uh, to be part of the group. Uh, and it doesn't matter how big the group is. And it also doesn't matter actually what exactly is happening there. Uh, but it is very important that there is something happening. So we are really trained to, uh, to react on things that are happening in the moment, which is kind of an improvisational school. Uh, and in that way, uh, uh, the group uh, that Chris Tunelli gave us, at least in Groningen, it's, it's really a huge gift. Uh, so it's, it's really like a, a school for 
uh, improvisers. Uh, and uh, in, in that case, I think it doesn't really matter if you like it or you don't like it. Uh, but we, what really matters is that you are there and that you act and you respond in which way ever. So uh, in, in that way, at least it works for me uh, really, really excellent. And it also really works for me uh, for all my life. So it's not just uh, very special uh, for uh, experiencing the dynamics of the group, of the choir, but it's also very important for me to have that uh, in, the, uh, in the next step uh, to put into my life. And uh, I, I think this is uh, the special uh, next step for the work we are doing together. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, too. <laughs> uh, it's, it's good to hear the, the perspectives uh, of the participants, of course. Um, are there any other members of Juxta Voices in the room here that might want to share their uh, experiences from participating in the choir? I'm not sure I see a lot of uh, initials, but I'm not sure who's who uh, here. Oops. Anyone else want to open their mic and share their experience? Yeah. Oh, Julie's just going to say something. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm Martin's wife, and uh, it was a case of if you can't beat them, join them. When Martin said he was going to, uh, well, he didn't say he was going to start this choir, but uh, I thought, oh, well, I'll go along. It was a Saturday morning, and um, as he said, immediately, that first warm-up, and um, something has been dynamic within the group, and we all got so much from it. And you now I used to think about, well, what is it about this? I think we emanated something on stage, and that's what attracted people, and that's what they wanted to be part of. Because, uh, you know, it was something about bringing something out of you that you didn't realize you had inside because you've never had that opportunity or you've lost that opportunity after childhood because we were experimenting with our voices in a way that children do mm. often adults you know it's drummed out of them either they're taught how to sing or they stop experimenting or they're told they can't sing and for jets voices it didn't matter yeah um, as part of a whole, even if you couldn't sing in pitch, you could make a great sounding chord. And that was our first warm up exercise. You know, and it was really exciting, so enjoyable. We all really look forward to it. And I think for some people, it was therapy. You know, it actually, whatever was going on in their lives, it actually gave them something that gave them confidence and made them part of something. It was more than the sum of its parts, actually. I think what is very nice is the, 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 the way that we can accommodate both vocal bravura. There are, there are some people within the group who will perform very positively and very energetically, but there are, there are, there are equally people in the group who have actually got very weak voices with, with no no vocal power at all but we we make pieces that everyone can participate in e even if you can't go out there and just grandstand and 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 and, and, uh, and, and bang it out to you those little voices can be heard within the group and uh, that, that's something i like very much in fact sometimes the group's at its best when some of those um, grandstanding voices aren't there Thank you for, for adding uh, that. Um, it's, it's beautiful to hear about the, the fact that the, the sounds of some of these untrained voices might be having those effects on the audience. When I, I think it might have something to do as well with um, the improvisatory elements um, of, of uh, your group. Um, is there uh, anyone else that has a question before we conclude? Last chance. We've gone for about an hour.
Okay, we'll end it there. It was, uh, it was so lovely, uh, Martin, to learn more about your work uh, and to talk across uh, these two projects. Uh, I hope we have another chance uh, to speak about them in the future. Uh, I hope I have a chance to come to Sheffield and, and see the ensemble uh, in its home environment. Uh, obviously, you're making a, a beautiful impact uh, on Sheffield and beyond, right? The, the group tours as well a little bit, is that right? Uh, well, I think to touring is perhaps a rather extravagant description. <laughs> But uh, well, uh, at one point, I guess we were doing 10 or a dozen gigs a year, um, in, in, in mainly in the north of England, uh, uh, occasionally a little further afield. Okay, wonderful. So uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you, Antje. Thank, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Bernd. Uh, uh, and thank Chris. everyone uh, for being here tonight. Thank you. This was thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thanks. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.